This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by author Matt Bell. Don't miss his new book, A Tree or a Person or a Wall, a collection of new fiction and one out-of-print novella. Lauren Groff, author of Fates and Furies, calls Matt's writing glorious, sinuous, and darkly magical. Learn more over at mattbell.com. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 220 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Hanu Rayanimi. He's a Finnish science fiction author who holds a PhD in string theory from the University of Edinburgh, and he recently co founded the biotech startup Helix Nano. His popular Jean Le Flambeur trilogy, The Quantum Thief, The Fractal Prince, and The Causal Angel, is about a gentleman thief living in a densely imagined far future world. And we'll be speaking with him today about his new short story collection, Invisible Planets, from Tachyon Publications. And today's show is brought to you by author Matt Bell, whose new novel, Scrapper, about a boxer struggling with a dark past in modern day Detroit, is out now in paperback. And here's a description of the book it says Detroit has descended into ruin. Kelly scavenges for scrap metal from the 100,000 abandoned buildings in a part of the city known as The Zone, an increasingly wild landscape where one day he finds something far more valuable than the copper he's come to steal, a kidnapped boy crying out for rescue. Briefly celebrated as a hero, Kelly secretly avenges the boy's unsolved kidnapping, a task that will take him deeper into The Zone and into a confrontation with his own past and long-buried traumas. The second novel from the acclaimed author of In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods, Scrapper is a devastating reimagining of one of America's greatest cities. Its beautiful architecture, its lost houses, shuttered factories, boxing gyms, and storefront churches. With precise, powerful prose, it asks, what do we owe for our crimes, even those we've committed to protect the people we love? Publishers Weekly says the book has the feel of Cormac McCarthy's The Road set in present-day Motor City and the New York Times Book Review calls it equal parts dystopian novel, psychological thriller, and literary fiction. So again, the book is called Scrapper by Matt Bell, and you can learn more over at mattbell.com. All right, and so now here's our interview with Hanu Rayanimi. All right, so we're here with Hanu Rayanimi. Welcome to the show. Hello. Very happy to be here. Okay, so how did you first get interested in science fiction? I think that goes back to uh, first grade and finding a copy of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in uh, our school library, uh, which I sort of went on to devour and then then started uh, coming up with all kinds of spaceship and submarine designs and also subsequently read first all Jules Verne books I could find and then also H.G. Wells and, and every other book in the uh, science fiction section of the local library. So was that just something that you that was completely on your own, or was anyone else, any parents or teachers or friends, reading science fiction? No, that was pretty much on my own. I mean, I, I grew up in a very small town in um, uh, in sort of north of the middle of Finland, uh, only about ten thousand people, and uh, there weren't that many science fiction readers there at the time. Mm. I mean, how is science fiction viewed in Finland? Is it sort of seen as nerdy, or like how do people regard it? Um, I think it's changed a lot. Um, so certainly there's a certain nerdy perception probably to, to the general subculture, but I think the, uh, more sort of younger generations have a different attitude. Um, there's a huge amount of interest in Finland in things like manga and anime as well. Um, and now you also have had in recent years some, uh, fairly mainstream, uh, big name literary prizes go to speculative fiction. So, so I think it's, uh, changing quite a bit. I think as part of a general shift towards bigger acceptance of science fiction and fantasy and culture in general. Right. Cause I've heard you said that you were really into Dungeons and Dragons and games like that as well. Mm, absolutely. So, so that was, in fact, um, I think the way I first got into telling stories and world building. And, uh, that was just uh, something we started with uh, a couple of friends. Um, soon after Jules Verne, actually, I, I think I would have been sort of eight or nine years old when I first started playing role playing games. I didn't actually start out with D and D, but with uh, RuneQuest uh, and then also Cyberpunk, and um, and did D and D as well, but that actually came later. So so I think it was a um, had had more of an indie flavor to it uh, from the start. Hmm. I mean, are there any incidents that stick out in your mind from your years playing pen and paper role playing games? 
Um, we had a really intense vampire the masquerade campaign when I was in high school. So, so we would get together with a bunch of friends, uh, in uh, the basement of this kind of like, um, uh, youth house, uh, publicly funded, uh, space for young people to hang out. And we would sort of play in this candlelit environment. And, uh, and that was a game that went on for, uh, I think almost three years and spanned uh, 400 years of history and, uh, and, and sort of with lots of really dramatic moments and ups, ups and downs. Uh, so that's, that's sort of, uh, one, one thing that, uh, comes to mind. There, there are more, more sort of specific instances also later when, uh, uh, I played, got more into LARPs, uh, at university, uh, that involved, uh, games that, uh, took place, for example, in a nursing home where all the players played either sort of senior citizens in the nursing home or nurses and, and, uh, and staff, staff members. And, uh, that was, that was quite a striking experience to actually really feel what it's like to be an old person whose autonomy is severely restricted, where we're sort of being able to sneak out to have a cigarette felt like a major victory. Hmm. Right, because I heard you say that in Finland, LARPing is a very advanced sort of uh, form of expression and that it gets arts council funding and things like that. That's right. So, so there is this whole bigger phenomenon of Nordic LARPs. I think that sort of includes games in uh, Denmark, Norway, uh, Sweden, Finland, where um, the games are very ambitious in terms of uh, storytelling and uh, experimental game mechanics and uh, immersive play and, uh, and scale as well. So people have done um, sort of science fiction games on these big cruise ships that sail between Finland and Sweden or, uh, staged, um, big, big LARPs about refugees with hundreds or, or thousands of players. Um, and, um, yeah, so, so it's really, um, artistically pretty ambitious and, and there is some government funding there as well. I think actually the current, uh, one of, one of the, uh, cabinet ministers in Norway, uh, is an active LARPer. Huh. So why do you think it's viewed so differently in Finland than in the United States, where certainly my impression is that it's much more looked down on? Um, I'm not, not entirely sure. So I think uh, the I haven't really studied the deep history of, of the LARP, uh, LARP phenomena in, in, in the Nordic countries. Certainly there's a few things like um, a conference called Knutepunkt uh, that has been organized for, uh, I think, a couple of decades now every year, which sort of draws uh, some of the practitioners of the field together that has sort of, have sort of uh, shaped and defined it and taken taken it into these uh, ambitious direct directions. So I think, uh, and maybe being disconnected somewhat from the uh, Anglo-Saxon world has, has helped uh, the field to develop in a completely different direction. Right. Well, it's it's striking to me that you say that you were able to play Vampire the Masquerade in this publicly funded youth space. Because, uh, you know, when I was in <laughs> high school, I tried to play Dungeons and Dragons at school with my friends and they wouldn't even let us play in school because they thought mm -hmm. it was satanic or something. Right. Um, and... that, that was something that was something we had to overcome as well. But uh, but the sort of people running the space were pretty accommodating. So. Oh, so there was that kind of uh -huh. thing. Yeah, there was a, as well. there was a I think Finland had its own version of the uh, Dungeons and Dragons is, is Satanism craze, which uh, was directly fed by the similar things happening in the U.S. But, uh, um, and there was a, uh, I, I think one, one lady who, who, um, felt she had sort of lost her daughter to role playing games on national television, speaking out against them and cautioning parents, uh, against them. And I think my parents actually, uh, for a short period there got worried about what I was into. But, uh, but I think we, we but they also so kind of saw that my circle of friends was pretty normal and we weren't really, really doing any blood sacrifices or anything. And we played, played quite a lot of games in our, in our house as well. So, so it was pretty clear that nothing, nothing too, too uh, sinister was going on. That's funny because you know, I've never been to Finland, but just in my imagination, I imagine it being much less dysfunctional than the United States with, you know, like good, like everyone's friendly and good schools and, uh, you know, low crime and stuff like that. Is that, do I have an inaccurate impression or? No, I think Finland certainly is, um, um, well-functioning welfare society, uh, really safe, really good education system and all that. But um, Finland does have its dark side. So um, the Finnish mentality does have a tendency towards depression, towards alcoholism. Uh, there's surprisingly 
um, surprisingly um, uh, sort of high amounts of violent crime in, in Finland, although although that's usually not uh, not sort of uh, gun related, but just sort of uh, fights and things like that. But um, yeah, I think I think the um, yeah I think it's still overall safer than the U.S. as a whole. But um, but but yeah, every every country does have its dark side, and Finland does have this bipolar nature of the winter being uh, extremely cold and long and dark, and then uh, in the summer you effectively have no night, so so people go a little bit crazy, um, and uh, and that dichotomy I think is there in a lot of a um, lot of Finnish culture. Right. Well, I've heard you talk about it just being dark all the time, like all day long and just walking home from school and looking at the stars and how maybe that helped inspire your interest in space and cosmology mm. and things like that. Uh, it certainly did. Uh, so so in a smaller town with less light pollution, the, the night sky was pretty spectacularly vis visible uh, in the winter. Uh, certainly, certainly true. And uh, uh, also encouraged uh, reading, uh, sitting inside and reading, reading books when there was nothing much else to to do um but um um i think uh, the other thing about the finnish landscape is that um people are fairly close to nature um a lot of finland is uninhabited um it's only about 5 million people in a fairly large geographical area and um so so most finnish people growing up uh, have a very strong experiences about walking in the woods and um experiencing experiencing uh, sort of untamed nature very directly and and um um so i was also a boy scout for quite a while so so we did did go also go into the woods and the uh, one aspect of that was was telling ghost stories around a fire so that was uh, that was quite fun as well well right and you use a lot of finnish mythology and folklore kind of things in your short stories was that a big mm. part of your childhood um well, there's a big general awareness of the mythological heritage in Finland. So, so this whole, the, the Kalevala cycle, uh, the, the national epic and, um, uh, is, is very strongly present, uh, uh, when you go to school and also, also in, uh, culture in general. Um, and, um, and Finland became, uh, a Christian country relatively late. It was sort of, I think late late Middle Ages that uh, the Swedes decided to have a little crusade to uh, convert the Finns, and um, but I think uh, to a large extent that conversion was sort of in name only, and uh, a lot of the uh, old old um, gods kept being worshipped in the woods, and uh, I think even my grandmother mentioned that they were still occasionally read uh, spells to to sort of ensure. Uh, better uh, milk production from cows and and things like that, so so traces of those those myths did persist um, for a long time, and it was in the nineteenth century actually that they were collected from oral tradition to and then and sort of turned into what is now now Kalevala by by Elias Lundrud. So um, um, so yeah, the, the the mythology in Finland is closer to the surface than uh, I think in many other parts of the world and um and yeah it's a very deep well to to draw upon i'm I'm certainly not the only finnish author to do that well right could you maybe say a little bit more about the specifics of some of these myths because i think they're probably unfamiliar to most of our audience so i mean there was like a, a grain god and sort of a death god and sort of a sea woman mm. that feature in these stories yeah, so uh, there, there is the cosmology of Kalevala, which uh goes back to world being born out of the uh um, the egg of this seabird. There's a few, there's a whole mythic cycle around um, uh, a few figures, namely uh, a, a sort of master sorcerer called Vainamoinen, a master smith called Seppo Ilmarinen, and uh, a character called Lemminkainen, who's the bad boy. Uh, he's like the Wolverine of, of, <laughs> of this this uh, ensemble, um, and um, they um, it, it, the cycle revolves around um, struggle. Uh, uh, for uh, a mythic device called the Sambo, which is actually this machine that Ilmarinen makes in order to win the hand of uh, the daughter of the the witch of Pohjola, uh, and um, and Sambo can grind wealth out of nothing. So so it can it has like these three funnels. Uh, one grinds gold, one grinds salt, and one uh, grinds grain. 
Uh, so kind of um, a source of infinite wealth, and then there is a big fight, fight and war over it. Um, and that takes place in a landscape that has all these older forces that the uh, the heroes struggle struggle with or ally themselves with. So Vainamoinen visits the Tuonela of the Land of the Dead, which is which does feature in one of my stories as well. Uh, a very dark and dismal dismal place, or or um, or there's there are these. Older gods, uh, uh, the sort of god of the, the of god of barley, Pellonpekko, or or, or um, the the god of the woods, and um, and and so on, they interact with. So, um, and and Sampo gets smashed up to to spoil spoil the story slightly, and uh, only fragments fragments remain, and and everybody kind of goes home disappointed, and and Bainamainen actually leaves Finland, um, uh, sort of. But promising to return one day when he's when he's needed, uh, so I guess it's a very very rough uh, capsule mm-hmm. summary of Kalevala. Right, and so were you always? Would you say equally interested in those sort of fantasy stories and the science fiction stories together, or did you sort of go back and forth? Or um, I think I went back and forth. Certainly, the um, science fiction came first, but then Lord of the Rings also hit me pretty hard. And my first encounter with that actually was um, a Finnish translation of The Hobbit, which had beautiful illustrations by Tuve Jansson, the creator of Moomins, uh, very, also a very famous, uh, Finnish artist. And, um, and I think that, that again, again, it was not much after I first encountered Jules Verne. So, so I would have been like eight or nine. And, um, and that, that, that I also found, found endlessly fascinating that, that you had these secondary worlds with their own, um, histories and languages and, and the sense of, a great depth, which um, you can already see hints of in The Hobbit, and and I, I was a pretty big Tolkien fan. I must have read um, Lord of the Rings like at least once or twice a year between sort of the ages of ten and twenty, <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, and of course sort of other other fantasy as well. So so I think fantasy also became became equally equally important. I, I don't think um, I've ever really felt the need so much to make a very Strict distinct distinction between science fiction and fantasy. I think they are just sort of uh, both examples of fiction where you have a wider palette uh, to, of, of um, elements to to explore and, and play with than in conventional mainstream fiction. But um, definitely uh, part of part of the same cluster of um, ideas and ways of looking at the world. Sure. And I think one story in this book that really drives that home for me is your story, Elegy for a Young Elk, mm. which is this very high technology, post-human sort of story, but it, re- it has a lot of the character and um, feel of a myth, you know, of a mm. Greek myth or something. Um, and again, so the, there's, a, there's a strong Kalevala connection there as well, because um, the way magic works in the Kalevala universe is uh, through song. Uh, and through poet, po- poetry, there's a specific um, metric which um, is pretty much the same that Longfellow uh, uh, used in um, the uh, Hiawatha cycle. Um, so, so that so some of the um, some of the poems that the main character uses to control these nanotechnological devices were sort of originally written to that metric. I mean, do you just want to say a little bit more about what that story is about for people who haven't mm. read? It? Absolutely. So, uh, so the story, uh, Elegy for a Young Elk is, um, set in this, um, a kind of post-singularity future where a lot of, uh, humanity has transcended and, and, and sort of been transformed by, um, uh, sort of brain, uh, augmentation technology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and has actually left Earth. Um, there's also been an outbreak of something called the God Plague, which, which, uh, is sort of a malevolent version of all these technologies that that sort of leads to these godlike entities who've lost control of their abilities or, or um, uh, end up end up causing a lot of chaos and destruction and um, so so the kind of civilization as we know it is gone and very few conventional human beings remain and the main main character is this uh, kind of bitter bitter poet called Kosonen who who lives in the woods with his uh, friend Otso who's sort of a, an uplifted uh sentient bear and um and one day uh his ex-wife shows up she's now effectively a goddess and asks for his his help to to sort of um retrieve something from uh a city of the plague gods where where the um 
uh, transcendent human beings are not able to go to, but he might be able to to get to. And um, and yeah, that's, that's sort of the beginning of the story. Right. And so as I was saying, it kind of reminds me of a myth because, you know, his his wife comes to him in a shower of rain, which is kind of reminds me of Zeus, right, from mm. Greek mythology. And mm -hmm. it's almost like this city is like a spell has been cast over it or something that only he can enter it. I mean, do you when you're writing a story like that versus a story dealing with the these Finnish gods, do, do they feel different in your mind or do they feel much the same writing the, the different kinds of stories? Well, I, I think in this story, I, I certainly tried to put a little bit more thought into the um, the, the sort of how how would how would actually things would actually work work underneath. But uh, but I do think that um, phenomenon we do see in science fiction, and I guess earlier in in space opera as well, is that the vocabulary we end up uh, reaching for uh, when we try to describe technology that has really sort of got into that Arthur C. Clarke indistinguishable from magic point inevitably becomes the language of myth and um, uh, and magic. So um, why, I don't think I was sort of deliberately trying to to go for a mythic feel, but that, that did somehow emerge from the telling of the story. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely, definitely that, um, mode of mode of thinking of the future as this mythic landscape and i think there are uh, other authors who do that as well elizabeth bear comes to mind a little bit and uh also um a great sort of influence uh on me was roger zelazny who deliberately blends myth with uh, in in uh, with, with sort of high technology in books like lord of light that uh, that is essentially a retelling of the hindu Myths and and uh, the coming of Buddha through in in a in a space colony with with, with these sort of um, um, astronauts with access to godlike technologies who've in fact set themselves up as as gods to the local populace. So so there's yeah and and you can also argue that um, superhero comics that I like quite a lot are are sort of uh, modern mythological pantheons that. Um, um, have have emerged so yeah i think myths and archetypes are are quite hard to to avoid uh if you if you enter um enter the the sort of um landscape of of the far future which is sort of this unknown unknown and and perhaps with the um uh, ideas around singularity even unknowable territory right well you mentioned the vocabulary that you use in these more far future science fiction stories. And there's a lot of really first class jargon uh, in these stories. <laughs> and you have the scientific background to, to do this really, really well. Um, I'll give you just an example from one of the stories. Mm -hmm. The character says, wiggle the M theoretic compactification moduli locally and the value of Newton's constant is altered. It creates a tidal propulsion gradient. Um, is all this stuff like based in real science or none mm -hmm. of this is sort of star trek style techno babble it's all no not, not not at all so so this this is referring to to some ideas around uh um sort of in in uh string theory that that uh where where sort of uh values of physical constants are determined by sort of radi radii of uh these extra dimensions which and and the idea of a bias drive where you where you change local values of gravitational constants is something that sort of NASA's breakthrough propulsion group has uh, has explored in real life. And um, although again the, the 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 sort of I think this uh, particular story I think that that's from the from Skywalker of Earth, which is this novella uh, in the collection, which is um, so that is very much uh, an homage to um, the stories of E. E. Smith. E. Doc Smith, uh, who pretty much out of whole cloth created modern space opera. And, um, he, he has these great pulpy stories of, uh, scientist heroes and scientist adventurers who do talk quite a lot like that. So, so they, he, uh, I mean, he was a, a chemist by, 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 uh, background and he does throw in a lot of what was sort of at the time real life popular science, um, and, um, and then tries to sort of Give the reader of some some glimpse of what is actually going on, but at the same time, you can sort of, if if you don't want to dig into the details, you can you can uh, just let it go past and uh, and try to try to have just have the impression that the characters kind of know know what's going on. Right, and just to give people an, like more of an impression of this, I have a couple of things I wrote down here. 
Vernoul Flame Fusion, Chone Drive, Penrose Generator, Quantum Dot Casters, Supersymmetric Matter, Xeno Catabolic Bacteria, Quantum Cryptocurrencies, and a Picotech Construct in the Space-Time Foam itself. Mm -hmm. Those are all real things? Um, well, for certain values of real, so some of the, some of them obviously are are more speculative than than, than others. But uh, but yeah, all of those terms could be could be unpacked and traced back to to real life, real life things or or real life speculation for sure. Um, maybe yeah, when we when we get to Pico technology, which is sort of sort of just a term for some form of technology that would exist below nanoscale, sort of using manipulating uh, quarks. Um, uh, at the very sort of uh, low level of um, elementary particles or, or uh, space-time foam, this kind of hypothetical idea of what space-time might look like, uh, very close to the Planck scale, to the kind of scale where, where concepts like um, um, distance and time become actually quantum objects, which we don't understand. So, so there's, um, yeah, there, there's definitely a spectrum of scientific rigor, rigor there, but, um, but sort of, yeah, I, I try, try to use, use terms that at least are, are, are somehow derived from in this kind of more hard scientific context, um, that are somehow derived from, um, uh, uh, things that I've read about in scientific papers or, uh, other sources. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, one of the editorial reviews for your short story collection that's on Amazon kind of jumped out at me from the daily. They say this book isn't for your grandfather. This isn't a book for the Star Wars fan. This isn't a book for someone just getting into reading sci fi. And how do you do you agree with that? How do you feel about that? Um, I think there's some stories in that collection, which are, I would say, pretty accessible to anyone who just uh, enjoys short stories. Um, some some of some of the other ones, like perhaps Skywalker or Earth, do assume uh some sort of science fictional literacy or or previous exposure to to the science fictional texts that it refers to and riffs upon. Um but there's a whole bunch of stories there that, that I think would be uh accessible or readable uh by someone who's just sort of um uh reading science fiction for the first time and uh um Certainly, I've had uh, pretty positive comments about some of them, even from my, let's say, members of my writers group or, or friend, friends who who have not read science fiction before. So, so I'm not sure it's completely accurate, but but there's definitely a couple of stories there that uh, are where the target audience is more of a um, science fiction uh, sort of seasoned science fiction reader. I mean, is that something you think about while you're writing? Is what, what how many people will be able to follow this, or is you just write the story the way you want to write it and let the chips fall as they may? <laughs> More the latter. So, so I, I do want to uh, generally write stories that I that I um, want to read myself uh, and that that I think I would find uh, find entertaining or or address some some itch itch that I have. Um, yeah, but I mean, you know, I accept feedback, and in, in some cases. If my writers group says, uh, "Okay, this paragraph here is completely incomprehensible," then obviously <laughs> something needs to be done there. There usually, but uh, uh, in the initial creation stage, I don't tend to worry about uh, that too much. Right. Okay. So you've mentioned this writers group. So tell us a little bit about who they are and how you got hooked up with them. Um, so the um, original writers group I, I belong to in Edinburgh um, uh, has been around for I think over twenty years, um, and so it has this. Uh, so, so, so the members, uh, long-time members, have, uh, include people like uh, Charlie Stross and uh, uh, Alan Campbell and others who've um, made their name uh, as successful authors since. But um, also, just a lot of lot of excellent uh, local local writers. Um, the group also has a spoken word wing, which is how I first came into contact with it. So, um, soon after I moved to Edinburgh to do my PhD, I went to one of their gigs. Um, and, uh, I was really enthralled by kind of the, the quality and combination of sort of, uh, very dark humor and, and, and sort of high concepts that, uh, they used in their stories and, um, ended up, ended up joining the, the group, group soon after. And, um, so we met, um, every month, um, circulated some, some work, um, a week before the meeting and then went around the table and, and gave some very, frank and occasionally painful uh, mm -hmm. critique but that, that was really i think um one of the absolute key things for me to to become a writer um through through the 
uh, interaction with uh, with those guys and and girls. Um, the group still exists. I now, of course, live in San Francisco. I do keep in touch with them, uh, and we've actually just now I've now sort of uh, with a couple of people here started a started a new group that hopefully uh, will become a similar source of uh, uh, helpful helpful critique and and kind of also uh, psychological support in the in the lonely. <laughs> lonely uh, uh, road uh, of writing. So how much fiction writing had you done when you joined that group? Not much at all. So my, uh, uh, I think the story I submitted to the group uh, as a kind of sample piece uh, when they invited me to, to come along uh, was, I think, the second story I ever wrote. So, um, so not much at all. But, um, but I had had some um, exposure to, to to the practice of building characters and world building and so on through uh, through role playing games, so so that a lot of that seemed to translate to um, to writing fiction, fortunately. So was that really intimidating having a story critiqued by Charlie Strauss or somebody like that when you were so <laughs> new? Absolutely. So so that was a, that first meeting was was really really scary and uh, uh, and I was definitely cringing cringing quite a lot through the first meeting, but uh, but they were all really uh, polite and uh, kind of nice nice about it. Um, and um and yeah after uh, so so but i think with any uh as as with any famous authors you you do tend to quickly realize that they're also human beings and and uh, uh once you get to once you get to know them so um so yeah the uh, that uh it did get easier uh as time went on hmm. well you said that they were really blunt in their criticism or they didn't hold back? I mean, do, mm -hmm. do any um, examples stand out in your mind where they just rake, really raked you over the coals about something? Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, sort of, um, this is now really like almost 10 years back. So <laughs> um, let me, let me see. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure there were some, there were, there were some paragraphs. Uh, like I, I think um, at some point I was circulating some of the, uh, Early chapters of the Quantum Thief, for example, and and people people did sort of uh, um, highlight passages that were just sort of completely impenetrable to them and and uh, needed to be needed to be uh, rewritten. So so and and sort of read out lists along the lines of uh, you just did of of what, mm -hmm. what they felt were were techno jargon. So yeah. Hmm. Well, okay. So you were in Scotland. You said to do your PhD. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you now describe yourself as a recovering string theorist. So what's that about? <laughs> um, so I, I very much enjoyed my my PhD. I had a great uh, great supervisor, um, and um, and and sort of uh, ended up doing some quite interesting work on sort of the intersection of string theory and uh, and, and pure mathematics. Uh, but towards the end of my PhD, together with a friend of mine, Sam Halliday, we started to have doubts about. A long-term academic career in string theory, and um, uh, felt that maybe there was something more sort of real-world oriented we could do, which uh, would sort of make our work accessible to more than, let's say, ten other people in the world. And uh, we ended up doing a piece of consultancy work for for Motorola uh, related to network optimization, and that uh, that project went really well. And as a result, we we then started what sort of became like a mathematics consultancy business that we then ran um, about uh, six years and, and uh, ended up doing some really cool work for the likes of European Space Agency and uh, UK Ministry of Defense and uh, um, working in life sciences and uh, the oil and gas sector and, uh, and finance and uh, sort of just, just uh, sort of constantly learning about New fields of of business and technology, and uh, and figuring out what the interesting mathematical problems there were, and and sort of together with the team that we built, then trying to solve them. And um, um, yeah, so so um, I'm quite proud of some of the work we did, and and um, um, it did eventually move pretty far from string theory. But I think what uh, we both, both Sam and I, got out of string theory was sort of the um, not being intimidated by by mathematics and and sort of being able to relatively quickly pick up whatever tools we needed to to tackle the problems we uh, came across in more more applied context so um and in terms of recovering from string theory itself uh, i think we both also became a little bit disillusioned with uh, string theory as a subject uh, at least as a sort of candidate for theory of everything. And, and I think that's a sentiment that um, 
is not uncommon amongst physicists these days that um, um, string theory has sort of led to some very interesting uh, theoretical ideas and possibly some very very deep ideas that will be relevant to physics, but it also has a lot of very obtuse uh, branches that probably are not going to really help us to understand the universe much better. So, uh, and the problem is that it's very hard now to connect a lot of it to experiment in any way. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, there is a bit of a string theory hangover there as well. Right, because it must be sort of a daunting prospect to be thinking about devoting your entire career to a field where it's not clear if there ever is going to be any experimental verification for any of it, right? Mm, absolutely. Um, and um, I think if one really wants to fund fundamentally be a theoretical physicist, then that is a reality that one has to has to accept. And um, uh, and a lot of the ideas there, they're sort of are beautiful in their own right. And one can derive a lot of satisfaction from just sort of building very beautiful mathematical or, or, or theoretical ideas. But um, yeah, that, that wasn't wasn't uh, something that um, we wanted to do at that point. Yeah, and so now you're into biotechnology. Mm -hmm. That's that's right. So 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 currently, I'm a co-founder of a, a biotech startup called Helix Nano. Um, can't tell you, can't sort of uh, say too much about uh, in detail what we're doing doing, uh, but um, it sort of relates to using uh, the power of DNA sequencing and DNA synthesis to to um, come up with new ways of doing essentially gene therapy. Um, and um, and biology, I think, is a very, very exciting field right now. There's um, new tools uh, have become available that help us understand living systems much better and also, also to start to manipulate them. And uh, the development of some of these tools has happened at a really astonishing rate that, that sort of outstrips even uh, Moore's law in... in uh, in, in sort of uh, silicon-based technologies. Uh, so the cost of sequencing a human genome has gone from, uh, I guess, originally $3 billion uh, in the Human Genome Project uh, to, to about uh, $1,000 in, in less than 20 years. So um, so the pace is, is really uh, astonishing. Um, at the same time, biology also uh, appears to have more and more layers of complexity than we ever could have, could have imagined and, uh, and actually... We, we really cannot uh, yet, if ever, treat biology completely in terms of uh, technology and, uh, and engineering. But, uh, but certainly, uh, we are starting to be able to do some pretty, pretty amazing things uh, using, using tools like uh, gene editing to, to sort of um, very precisely manipulate genomes of, of living organisms. And, uh, um, and I think something that we'll also see is pretty, pretty uh, Scare, slightly scary, but uh, interesting stuff in uh, in how in, in sort of reproduction, um, how how um, um, sort of genome engineering uh, at the level of uh, embryos uh, is going to be possible. That already is is almost possible. Um, so yeah, so it's a very very exciting exciting space. Um, and um, there are also a lot of unsolved problems that don't require. Um, sort of technology at the scale of the Large Hadron Collider to to um, get a handle on. So, hmm. Laura, because I saw you said science fiction has done physics to death. I mean, do you see yourself turning more to biotech for inspiration for science fiction stories? Um, absolutely, and I'm and I'm actually uh, planning currently a, a near future, uh, very biotech driven driven story. Um, so focusing on more more of the dystopian uh, or potentially, well, maybe dystopian is not the not the right word. The sort of unpredictable uh, side effects of uh, of all these technologies and, and various ways they could be could be used. Um, so the the idea there actually is to look at sort of a dark biotech startup. So um, one interesting thing I learned about recently is that the entire tech startup ecosystem. Um, has a kind of a shadow in, in real life. So very successful cyber criminals now uh, become effectively dark angels or dark venture capitalists who fund the next generation of cyber criminals. Um, and uh, having sort of gone through some of the ups and downs of, of uh, creating a startup, I sort of want to explore um, uh, that, that, that kind of environment and, and how, how this kind of... Um, 
struggle uh, with the ups and downs would translate into a dark biotech world of the near future. Yeah, no, the, the dark angel investors, that's a fascinating idea. I never heard of that before. Um, yeah, so so all, all so you actually have uh, young cyber criminals coming and giving pitches <laughs> to to these these uh, people, and uh, and getting getting funding and eventually growing their their uh, startups into entire big sort of shell shell companies that get sold or or uh, exited. So <laughs> I'm curious, what you've seen the movie Gattaca? I assume. What do you think of that? Um, it's a great movie. Uh, it, it does sort of. Um, do a lot of really interesting exploration of the social consequences of um, of, of uh, gene sequencing. Now, now I think uh, technically and scientifically, it's probably largely inaccurate. But the um, but yeah, the, the, the sort of ideas that it plays with are are things we are going to have to confront pretty soon uh, in some form or another. Um, now, um, I think our um, Understanding of how that might, would play out has probably changed quite a bit since since Gattaca came out. But um, but it's very easy to imagine a near future world where uh, genome sequencing becomes completely ubiquitous. When we go a little bit further from the thousand uh, dollar price point to like one dollar or one cent, where we all have genome sequencers in our smartphones, and suddenly uh, you can uh, sequence anyone you meet and uh, figure out. A lot of things about uh, their hereditary diseases. Their, their, their sort of may, maybe there are are some um, complex combinations of mutations that that sort of relate to things like risk propensity or or uh, what what would you sort of what would a potential date uh, uh, be as sort of a reproductive partner and, and 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 so on. Where suddenly this this entire new dimension will will come into social interactions so so it's i think it's going to be sort of uh uh to get to the to the nth power hmm. well that thing about you know what would a potential date be like kind of reminds me of your story at the jagad cathedral mm -hmm. which is sort of social media on steroids and the main character has this app that in real time predicts how likely he is to get laid that night uh, <laughs> based on the interactions he's having with this girl yeah, so that's also the kind of data that Tinder is probably in a position to to collect now, and uh, uh, I would imagine is already looking at and using to to um, to analyze uh, what sort of matches lead to to good outcomes for the user. Um, the the other thing in this uh, story is that then a lot of these interactions are actually gamified, so so you then try to sort of um, Talk to people who who would sort of enhance your influence score or or sort of cloud like score or or um, or, or sort of um, help you maximize whatever functions you want to to maximize. So so I think um, in real life you can you can see a bit of this happening in terms of uh, people fine tuning their their profiles to um, achieve a desired effect to to sort of give them give give a very uh, positive picture of themselves to the world, and I think uh, as as we sort of move closer to to sort of a ubiquitous augmented reality, uh, where there's a digital layer to all our interactions, then uh, that sort of thing is probably going to start happening in real time. Well, I mean, one thing I really liked about this story is I feel like in most science fiction stories, if it were about a future where there's more social media, it would be sort of very broad satire. But everything mm -hmm. in this story, I, I was just reading it, and I said, "Oh yeah, I, I can. This is definitely going to happen." <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Um, I think that that's um, the, the sort of social media aspect is um, kind of in the background in that story. In any case, so I just wanted to to throw in a few few sort of background elements that I thought were were likely to happen, and then the, the sort of main thrust the story of the story is about this. Um, um, Kind of restrictions uh, around uh, government and corporations controlling our our computer platforms and and actually restricting what we can do with them. So so this kind of trusted computing idea that has been around. Cory Doctorow has talked a lot about that, where um, so where the sort of core idea of a computer is that it's a universal machine that can do anything we wanted to do and we can transform it into other machines just by programming differently and uh and suddenly uh we sort of have entities 
like Apple now uh, already, um, who are able to decide what uh, we can or cannot run on devices that we own, and then then how can you sort of get around that? And and in the story, then then you have have sort of uh, people taking quite radical approaches, not to spoil it too much, to 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 uh, circumvent that those restrictions. Well, well, yeah. So say a little bit more about the world here, because you have there was something called the Assange Lips, and <laughs> then um, people basically divided into the juggies and the people on F plus, right? Ah, uh -huh, exactly. So, so you have you have um, this very large scale cyber attack that that leads to sort of thousands of deaths and and uh, a hard government crackdown across the world uh, on uh, universal computing. Um, every every uh, Every computer in the world, every mobile device in the world becomes a trusted computing device, and you have uh, most most people sort of uh, ending up on F plus, sort of a fusion of Google, Google and Facebook, uh, this corporate walled garden where where everything is kind of safe and and uh, where where sort of these um, a, lot, a lot of these uh, social media tools for optimizing your engagements live, and then you have the juggies who are who are sort of these um, um, sort of resourceful hackers who try to scrape together old unrestricted hardware to to do to do things that the new hardware doesn't allow and and, and sort of who try to sort of spoof facial recognition software by wearing di a different 3d printed mask every day and uh and building their own sort of uh dark nets to peer-to-peer -to -peer networks to to sort of stay away from the, the mainstream internet and um actually that was, was uh, uh very recently this um uh, Russian app that that does facial recognition very well uh, sort of appeared, and that's uh, <laughs> I didn't quite realize it would happen so soon, but uh, it does seem to be um, uh, going going in that direction. I mean, given that there's the Assange lips, I assume that's like Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how do you feel about him and about like 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 I know the story doesn't necessarily express your own views, but what would mm -hmm. what, what would you want to see in this sort of social media technology future? Well, uh, personally, I, I would like us as users to have a bit more control over our own data. So, so, so to move away from a model where uh, all our data lives on someone else's server, and we don't actually know how much they have and and uh, what did they use it for, but more into into sort of a, a kind of model that, for example, Jaron Lanier has has advocated, where we we keep all our data and then. If we want to share parts of it, then then uh, we can open sort of little windows to it, but with with restrictions on on what's uh, what the other other parties see, and and we kind of decide what they use it for. But I, I think that is extremely extremely unlikely to actually happen. I think we're sort of past that point where uh, these um, where where companies like Facebook and Google have have already uh, so much power, to so so much so much so much sort of added value that they they provide us that that it's very hard at this point to change the model uh entirely um as as for um it's it's an interesting question now it's it's been a while since i wrote the story what i what i, what I think about julian assange i mean uh wikileaks uh of course has been a very um uh, interesting and sort of controversial controversial um uh thing but uh it does i think represent um a new new thing a sort of new new way of um the internet sort of uh disrupting some of the uh, existing power power structures and making it possible for these massive leaks uh, leaks to occur um even when initiated by a very small number of individuals and and uh i think to some extent in increased transparency is a good thing but now now i think that that same mechanism is then being used also to uh, essentially manipulate American politics by possibly by by a Russian intelligence service, which uh, then uh, shows that 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 kind of capability also has a flip side. So, um, but yes, I mean I think the uh, that that is the that is the price of um, and and that illustrates the sort of changing nature of conflicts uh, in uh, in today's world where where it's all becoming very distributed asymmetric uh on 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 one hand uh on 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 the other hand um uh manipulation of all this all this data uh and its ownership is becoming more and more centralized so um so it's kind of uh yeah it's it's a bit of a bit of a paradox uh, really uh, and i and i think actually 
that's something that I always tend to find that lives at the heart of interesting science fiction stories is some sort of contradiction or a paradox, uh, because that's frequently what we find in reality as well. Yeah. I mean, I haven't read your Quantum Thief trilogy, but I was reading up on, on it a little bit. And it sounds like in that you have people who are so committed to privacy that if you meet someone and they don't want you to remember them, you can sort of set it so that they can't remember you. Did I that's right. That right? That, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. So uh, a lot of the uh, first book, The Quantum Thief, takes place in a um, the city state on Mars called Ubliet, which um, um, one of a, one of the most fundamental values there is uh, indeed privacy. So there is completely ubiquitous computing and sensing uh, at a sort of very very high nanotechnological level um, everywhere. But um, there is a system called Gebelot, which is essentially privacy settings for reality. So with every interaction, you can you can uh, the, the sort of natives of Ubliet actually have uh, kind of a privacy sense that that uh, allows them to sort of subconsciously decide who they share uh, a particular memory or a particular interaction with. Um, and uh, in the case of The Quantum Thief, that actually wasn't part, uh, an attempt uh, at a social commentary or or it wasn't really a result of any kind of deep thinking on social media, but I uh, it came about because I wanted to tell a um, detective story uh, or a gentleman thief story set in the far future. Um, so um, for kind of old-fashioned detective work to happen, there had to be some restrictions on what the technology was able to do and, and introducing some social norms around that seemed to be like a possible way to accomplish that. Uh, so do you have any opinions, though, on whether it would be a good thing for that sort of privacy system to exist? Um, I think it would be a good thing. There, there, are, there are some utopian aspects to to the way it's described in The Quantum Thief. Um, but um, I, I just, like I said, I, I, I worry that uh, giving that, that it may be, may be unrealistic. And it's probably going to get worse because the next step is going to be... Um, that we're going to be wearing smart glasses or, or mixed reality headsets pretty much constantly. Um, and uh, in order to function, those devices will have to, um, in real time, keep st scanning our sort of 3D, 3D environments and, um, uh, and know what we're actually looking at. And uh, so, so the sort of resolution of information being gathered about us is going to become uh, extremely, extremely high. And I just don't think the current model is going to be very easy to shift to a situation where we control that data. Um, maybe I, I, I really hope I'm wrong and some, some sort of alternative distributed, decentralized, uh, open approaches will emerge. But I, looking at the way how these tools are being developed and controlled by the, the current big players, I do think it's unlikely. Hmm. I mean, speaking of scanning people's brains, that kind of reminds me of your story in here, Snow White is Dead. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Sure. So so that was a fun experiment uh, I did together with my uh, sort of former co-founder, Sam Halliday. Um, so we um, it, it really started from us looking at some interesting things happening with brain-computer interfaces, and we, we decided that um, we wanted to play around with um, being able to create an interactive sort of installation or an art piece where uh, which was very much driven by the viewer's brain and um so we got um a bit of art funding for that and we we bought uh, an emotive epoch um headset or a couple of them which um is basically an EEG headset so it's uh, it's a it's a very simple brain scanner it has 14 electrodes that uh, touch your scalp and then uh, measure uh, electrical activity in your brain, and it can talk to um, a computer via, via Bluetooth. And um, so, what does after some sort of iteration of back and forth on what we should actually do with it, um, we came up with Snow, Snow White is Dead, and Snow White is Dead is what we ended up calling neurofiction. So it's like um, it's an interactive fiction piece, like choose your own adventure, but without conscious choice. So. Every um, so you you sort of sit down in front of a computer screen wearing this uh, brain scanner and start reading and to you it feels like a linear short story, but in fact the um, sequence of the scenes uh, that that happens is determined by your your sort of electroencephalography response to each scene, and um, and it was uh, I mean it, it's um, sort of exposed 
uh, the limitations of the technology. Uh, we, it's, it's sort of, we, we initially we had sort of visions about being able to actually measure the reader's emotions and identify what emotions they were experiencing and then try to take them through a specific emotional arc. So that didn't turn out to be possible. But what we were able to do was to just sort of, uh, uh, reduce that to just a couple of, a uh, couple of variables. And, and the way we implemented that was that, uh, so everybody reads two scenes in the beginning that are, that are the same. And one of them has a lot of, um, sort of imagery associated with life. And the other one has a lot of imagery associated with death. Then we kind of compare the, the reader's response to the subsequent, uh, scenes to their response to life and death. And then it sort of, uh, branches off based on based on uh, how they how they react so um and we exhibited this at uh, uh the uh the edinburgh science festival and uh got quite a lot of uh uh good responses from from people who who went through it and uh uh collected a bit of bit of data that that we we uh then that that sort of went into um figuring out the order of the scenes that um uh, uh it, that it is uh in the short story collection so um, so it was a very, very interesting experiment, both in terms of understanding where the technology is and what sort of constraints it places on telling stories with it. So, I mean, do people enjoy the stories more when it's being fitted to your brainwave patterns or? Um, I think people enjoy the experience. I think people enjoy the, the, the sort of, um, feeling of, uh, uh, being, being in control, even, even if it's to, to some, some extent, an illusion of being in control. So, so I think the framing of going through the, uh, um, experience in this kind of exhibition setting probably added, added quite a, quite a lot to it. Um, I think we would have to experiment with this form a lot more to, to actually, um, figure out what the, um, uh, the sort of how, how, how what would, would actually be the kind of story that would want to be told through through this medium and i and i think for that we would need to read reach a much wider readership and the technology would be would be more mature but it's um um i think we we did uh uh sort of especially people who did it more than once sort of then then said that okay they they could they could feel that uh their response to a particular scene was was different uh the second time so so yeah there was definitely a wide spectrum of reactions I mean, what would you say is kind of the next step for using this technology for storytelling? Um, I think the, the, um, so if, if the hardware got a bit better, there would be, uh, and I'm sure it will, uh, in not too distant future, there would be quite a lot you could do. So you could actually, what would be interesting to do would be to, uh, and we tried to do this a little bit with Sam. What would be interesting to do is to just, um, gather a lot of data of people reading, um, conventional books and um and, and see what sort of patterns can be extracted and what, what sort of what sort of elements in the text uh, people react to um especially now that now that sort of um uh, there are new machine learning technologies like deep learning that make sort of this automated learning of features uh, more feasible it would be really cool to to see if we could sort of um i don't know i mean the science fictional context if we could find elements that would uh elicit a sense of wonder for example and then then try to try to write a story that uh, that optimizes for for those or, or or sort of so yeah i think i think um apart from the interactive aspect just just being able to gather more data and, and sort of hone down on, on on some eigen eigen texts or 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 sort of eigen features in in fiction that uh make us feel certain things would be really cool because, I mean, you say in the intro, you say, ideally, we wanted to look at what happens in a reader's brain when they read science fiction in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, I guess we're not at that stage yet, or are we? No. So, so well, it would have been perhaps... So, so, so there's... Um, uh, people have found some neural correlates for the experience of insight. Um, and that, that was actually what we originally wanted to do. So, so there's, um, uh, there is a particular sort of brain wave that is relatively predictably triggered when we solve a difficult problem um so so there's like this aha moment um and um and that has been studied um uh quite a lot uh by neuroscientists so 
that was kind of uh we 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 initially wanted to um see if we could detect that light bulb moment uh, i think a lot of a lot of science fiction stories do in- include some sort of conceptual breakthrough uh where you suddenly realize that the world is not what you thought it was or or the character character experiences some sort of revelation but um but yes so the the we we couldn't couldn't do that with the hardware that we had access to that would have required like an fmri scanner or 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 something like that so um but yeah it would be interesting to to actually try to do that well right because there have been these experiments i've read about recently about how reading fiction makes you more empathetic Mm -hmm. and i strongly suspect that there are edifying effects of reading science fiction along those lines and i would like to see some you know, hard scientific data to that I could show to people to demonstrate that. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, the the um, there's there's a lot of evidence that when you read a book, you do construct a, um, a very detailed simulation of the the world you're reading about in your in your mind. And uh, and what's you, kind of often unique about science fiction is that the world itself is kind of like one of the characters as well. So so looking at how that world representation is different for science fiction than than for sort of uh, reading a reading a story that's is set in some sort of familiar contemporary reality. That'd be super cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so unfortunately we're pretty much out of time. Do you want to just say like what are you working on now, or what do you have coming up in the future? Uh, sure. So um, so I'm working um, towards just um, finishing up uh, a um, revised draft of uh, a novel that's coming out uh, next year called Summerland. Uh, which is very different from uh, my previous work in the sense that it's more of an alternate history book or uh, than uh, a uh, hard science fiction novel. Uh, you could actually describe the genre perhaps as ectopunk, <laughs> so a combination of steampunk and and uh, ideas coming from sort of late nineteenth century spiritualism and and their collision with uh, the physics of the time. Uh, so uh, it's a spy story where um, uh, in a world where the afterlife is real and, and can be contacted by radio. Uh, the main character has to try to uncover uh, a mole uh, in her intelligence organization, which is quite difficult given that she's alive and it seems that the mole is dead. So uh, so that's coming out next year. Um, uh, I've been writing a couple of short stories and uh, hopefully um, at some point in the next year or so, I'll also uh, do something with this dark biotech idea that we talked about. Right. So what is it, speaking of Summerland, what is it about the idea of the 19th century spiritualist movement that interested you? Um, so I think it's the idea of how a lot of that, those notions, um, are very similar to the utopian technology ideas we have today. So, um, there's a, um, particularly a very interesting character called John Murray Spear, uh, in New England in, uh, mid 19th century who, who had all these, fantastical utopian ideas about how being able to contact the spirit world would completely transform um the the transform society so so it was tied uh, together in his mind with with uh, social reform and he he was also a social uh, reformer in in real life who did a lot of uh, campaigning for women's rights and prisoners rights and so on but his ideas were just beautifully crazy so um so he came up with all these technologies like uh and his friend constructed what they called spirit armor this uh kind of contra- contraption of like iron man-esque armor of magnetic coils and uh electrical wires that were supposed to enhance a medium's uh, uh powers to to contact the afterlife um they came up with an idea for so so they were really worried about um monopoly of um telegraphy so so uh so western union was sort of uh, dominating um, the telegraph business, and they wanted to come up with a decentralized alternative. And uh, so this was before radio, but they, they so they proposed um, a network of decentralized telepathy towers, where where you would have a medium sitting in each tower, and you would have spirits passing messages um, uh, from one medium to another. So so you would have like, like this peer to peer network powered by uh, by uh, supernatural forces. And um, they and they actually tried to build that. They also tried to build uh, what they called the new motor, which was a combination of an artificial intelligence and uh, and a perpetual mobile, which which was sort of a, sort of an artificial being that would be powered by uh, by uh, spirit energy. And 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 then they they started a company making sewing machines powered by the new motor. 
Um, and and uh, and sort of, I just thought these ideas were first of all wonderfully absurd, and also th- sort of um, resonating with, uh, I think, with the more sort of utopian edges of how we think about technology today. And then, as I kind of dug into it a bit more, it became clear that a lot of the leading leading scientific figures of the day, uh, like um, uh, Lord Kelvin and uh, uh, Oliver Lodge and uh, William Crookes and, and and so on, were really thinking. Um, about afterlife very seriously in 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 scientific terms, and um, there was an organization called Society for Psychic Research in Britain in the late nineteenth century with all these guys as 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 members who who tried to look for scientific evidence for afterlife and constructed experiments with uh, sort of early radio. Sir Oliver Lodge, who co- sort of co-invented radio with Marconi, actually wanted to use use uh, his early devices to contact his dead son in the afterlife uh edison built uh, something he called the spirit telephone and, and 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 so on and um and kelvin came up with all kinds of ideas on on how um uh afterlife could actually exist in the fourth dimension and and uh, um so so yeah i just uh, thought thought that it would be interesting to try to see if we could take a lot of these ideas and assume that they were actually real and what sort of world would would emerge as a result? So, so uh, um, as a kind of exercise in speculating with an alternative cosmology and finding some stories to tell with it. And I mean, so I take it from the fact that you're comparing the modern sort of techno utopian movement to the spiritualist movement that you're not expecting to upload your mind and live in the cloud anytime soon. Uh, no. So I, I, I do do enjoy exploring these ideas in in fiction quite a lot, but I think the the um, uh, sort of, I'm, I'm I'm not what you might call a hardcore singularitarian. Um, and uh, and the more we sort of know about the brain, the 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 sort of more we <laughs> realize how how little we know, and and the, the sort of uh, practical aspects of actually sort of digitizing a human being uh, 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 are are pretty formidable. Now, I think the um, some some really interesting things will happen with. Um, real life uh, brain computer interfaces that will come around uh, in the next 10 20 years um i think it'll take a long time to uh, develop sort of a, anything resembling a mature mature ai i think there are maybe some also some fundamental issues that uh, with uh, ideas like sort of recursively self improving ais that um is kind of behind a lot of these intelligence explosion ideas of um of hardcore singularitarianism but um, but yeah, I, I think it's instructive to look at history and, and and see when we have we had similar ideas before, and uh, we had people had very similar ideas before uh, towards the end of the nineteenth century, which uh, I guess was also a period of radical technological change and um, 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 uncertainty and uh, economic turmoil. So so I think uh, when things get uncertain, we do do tend to construct uh crazy utopian <laughs> futures <laughs> all right yeah so i think we're gonna have to wrap things up there um but so we've been speaking with hanu Ryanimi, and we're talking about his book uh, it's called invisible planets the collected short fiction and so hanu thank you so much for joining us uh, thank you david it's been really fun and that was our interview so big thanks again to hanu Ryanimi for joining us on the show big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on itunes including Sean Y246, who writes, A great podcast, interesting and informative. Mr. Kirtley is always informed and has researched his interviewees. He always reads the books he's talking about and usually other books by the author. So a big thanks again to Sean Y246 for that great review. Special thanks as well to Johannes Hiller Jordan, Cameron N. Coulter, and Nick Oakley, who all just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank author Matt Bell for sponsoring today's show. Learn more about his new book, Scrapper and A Tree or a Person or a Wall over at mattbell.com. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. 
For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.